Good morning. Welcome to the beginning of Florida Climate Week. We appreciate the Volo Foundation sponsoring this very important event. And we're happy on behalf of Southern Alliance for Clean Energy to host this program, which is talking about tracking progress on clean energy solutions. Florida is already feeling the heat and paying the price from climate change. Sea level rise, chronic inland flooding, more extreme weather like killer heat and intensified hurricanes. Science tells us that we must limit global temperatures to a degree and a half Celsius if we are to avoid the worst implications of climate change. We must adapt to the impacts that are already baked into the pipeline, but perhaps more importantly, we must also dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Florida matters. If we were a country, we would have the 17th largest economy in the world. Yet Florida is terribly over-reliant on natural gas at 74%, and only 2.3% of our energy mix is met with solar uh, currently. We're going to hear more on that from my colleague Brian Jakes, uh, Jacobs later, who has some promising future news. This panel is going to discuss trends in clean energy solutions, energy efficiency, solar, and the electrification of transportation. Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, our mission is to promote responsible and equity energy choices to ensure clean, safe, and healthy communities throughout the Southeast. So why are we tracking progress? Because it's been often said that if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So we're here to track progress on the pathway to decarbonization. And I'm very honored to be here today with my four colleagues. And we are going to hear first from Maggie Schober, who is our Director of Utility Reform. Take it away, Maggie. Great, thank you, Susan. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna go through the emissions uh, uh, sector and the emissions profiles for Florida and the Southeast as a whole. Um, and I think it's important to look at the region uh, and then, you know, take a snapshot about where Florida is right now, uh, how we got there and, you know, what we um, would like to do about that. Uh, so these first slides, um, these first charts show uh, a snapshot of both uh, the Southeast and Florida. Um, in how many annual tons of CO2 are emitted uh, for these sectors. As you can see, the two major sectors uh, for both are both electric power and transportation. Um, and they've been fairly close for a while, uh, but notably a couple of years ago um, in, in 2015, the was the last year that um, electric power was, was higher uh, than transportation. So we are seeing a little bit of a shift um, in carbon emissions uh, by sector in both Florida and the Southeast. And this is reflective of you know, what's going on um, in these sectors at, uh, in the, the country as a whole. Um, so this is, this is where we've been, uh, but why, why do we have these, you know, these kinds of emissions trends? Um, well, if you'll see on the next slide, if we're focusing in on um, on the electric sector, uh, the electricity sector has really gone through, you know, decades and, and sort of different um, eras uh, where there have been um, preferred technologies. Um, there's been, you know, booms in different, different kinds of technologies. So, you know, in the, the 50s, we started out with coal. Um, a lot of the uh, coal plants that are still operating in the southeast um, were uh, were built in the 50s all the way in through the 70s. Um, there was a time where there was a lot of nuclear built. There hasn't been much of that lately. Um, in the 90s, uh, there was a big boom for gas. Um, and you can see that that has actually, you know, somewhat continued. Um, and we see a fair amount of solar uh, also coming online. Uh, but notably, uh, we still see a good amount of blue. So there's still um, you know, a good amount of gas uh, planned to come online um, even in the next few years um, and, and onward uh, beyond that. Um, so that gets us to our generation forecast. Uh, so the previous slide was, um, was capacity. This is 
This is the actual energy um, based on the fuel that we're using. Um, and this is, again, the snapshot of the Southeast as a whole. Uh, but there's some pretty general trends. Um, you can see the blue uh, is gas, the red is nuclear, the black is coal. That's the those are the primary resources that we're seeing. And if you go um, for the next one, we're going to zoom in on Florida and see what Florida is um, using. And, and you can see here that the, the chunk of the graph um, that is this dark blue for gas is, is significantly higher for Florida than it is even um, for the rest of the Southeast. Um, and notably from where we are today, 2021 um, on through uh, 2030, there is, there's not, not much of a dip in that blue. Um, there is a little bit of, uh, of the coal um, coming offline, but there is still you know, a, a planned uh, reliance on a little bit of coal as well. Um, and and the, the top pieces there, we have our solar and our energy efficiency. And we see, um, we see at least solar expanding, uh, but, you know, the, the question is, because is that enough? Is that going to get us to where we need to go? Um, so if you, if you look on this, uh, this last chart, um, this is a chart from our emissions report uh, where we report out on how utilities are doing um, on decarbonization. We look at both the utility level and the state level. Um, and we take a utility's current plan. So, um, you know, your utility looks out 10, 15, 20 years at what they will need, um, what kind of power plants they will need to meet the load uh, that they're serving. And they will set a plan for that. Uh, and right now, we're seeing a trend all across the Southeast. Um, this is, again, the, the Southeast as a whole, uh, but as we see a similar thing in, in just zooming in in Florida, uh, where the utility plans, um, while we have had some decarbonization of the electric uh, sector um, up till this point, uh, we're not seeing much over the next 10, 15 years. Um, and that is where uh, you know, this is a really critical time for that uh, decarbonization. Um, and the IPCC has said we need to get to uh, zero by 2040 to 2055. You can see those are the two lines in orange and green here. And that red line is, um, I mean, that's the, uh, the compilation of current utility plans. Uh, and we are not on track. Uh, where we are not even close, really, uh, when you look um, out into the, the farther future. Uh, so we're uh, at SACE working um, to, to change that. And um, my, my colleagues here are going to go through um, some of the, what we see as uh, three of the really key um, pieces to that, which are um, energy efficiency, solar. Um, and then the neat thing about um, looking at uh, looking back to, you know, our different sectors and the emissions, the more we decarbonize uh, the electric uh, generation side um, and the more we electrify the transportation side, uh, we can actually um, turn both of those um, carbon uh, lines down uh, towards zero uh, more quickly. So um, I look forward to uh, hearing from them. Back over to you, Susan. Great, thank you very much, Maggie. And next we're gonna to turn to Forrest Bradley Wright, who's the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, Energy Efficiency Director. Forrest. Thank you so much, Susan. Energy efficiency is a resource that utilities can use to invest in and offset the need for power generation. In effect, by investing in energy efficiency improvements to our homes and buildings, we reduce energy waste. And with it, we reduce the need for power generation. Examples of energy efficiency include many common things that you're familiar with, like efficient LED light bulbs, high efficiency air conditioning and appliances, air sealing for homes, and insulating uh, our homes. So one of the great things about um, addressing energy waste through energy efficiency is that many of these measures perform their very best at the times when we're using the most energy, for instance, at times of intense summer heat. So extensive experience across the country and research by our national laboratories have shown us that energy efficiency investments are the least cost way of meeting our energy needs. In this, 
energy efficiency is key to decarbonizing our electric grid and doing so affordably. Energy efficiency enables us to accelerate the retirement of outdated fossil fuel power plants. It also reduces, delays, or eliminates the need for new fossil fuel generation. In fact, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, the leading authority on these uh, subjects, has indicated that half of the United States obligations in carbon reductions from the Paris Climate Agreement can be met through energy efficiency. So not only is energy efficiency extremely important for meeting our decarbonization objectives, it actually can be um, invested in and matched up in such a way as to facilitate increases in renewable energy. So this in turn helps us to make the transition to a clean energy future. So with so much to love about energy efficiency, the question is, how are we doing with it? So my remarks today will focus on one important aspect of this topic, and that's utility investments in energy efficiency programs. Not discussed today, though also important, are building codes and federal lighting and appliance standards. So uh, every year, the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy publishes a report on energy efficiency in the Southeast. And what we're looking at here are some of the um, findings from our analysis. Um, these would be for energy efficiency savings in 2019, the most current year for which we have data. Um, and what we're using as our key metric is the annual energy efficiency savings compared to the previous year's electric sales. So in this way, we're able to look at what proportion of our energy needs are we meeting with energy efficiency? This also allows us to track utilities performance over time and to compare one utility to another. So uh, you'll see here on, on the left, the performance of the regions across the country, as well as the US national average. Uh, clearly the Southeast is trailing far behind most of the rest of the nation. Uh, with some um, regions performing at essentially 10 times as much efficiency delivered as we have been capturing in the Southeast. You'll also see that Florida is less than half of the Southeast regional average. So this presents, I think, reason for some real concern. It also causes us to ask some important questions about why is uh, efficiency performing so much lower in Florida uh, and what could we do to capture some of those opportunities to bring the financial savings to customers and the emissions reduction benefits of reducing our energy waste. So you will also see that um, Florida is the largest state in the region. Um, and as such, it has a large impact on the overall um, region's performance. Um, on the right, you see that uh, Florida's electric sales account for 28% of electric sales for the entire Southeast. But Florida is delivering only 15% of the region's energy efficiency savings. So there's a significant imbalance, and uh, I would say a significant amount of opportunity should we pursue some new strategies. So um, we also can look at um, how individual utilities are performing um, uh, across the region. And the, the first thing that I want to draw your attention to is this um, red line at the top. This is the average for major utilities across the US. There are 52 utilities analyzed to come up with this. Um, and it's just over 1% annual savings. So we can see that uh, the Southeast is substantially below that again at, at 0.26, it's about a quarter of that. Um, there is a US average here, which includes all utilities and it's lower. Um, this is because that includes smaller utilities, many of which do not have energy efficiency program offerings. Um, and so for the, the purposes of our discussion today, we'll mostly be focusing on that 1%. You can see that uh, Duke, in the Carolinas, so that's Duke Energy Carolinas and Duke Energy Progress, um, are the two utilities that have been in that range, that have been approaching 1% or, or near it. Um, whereas Florida utilities are trailing far behind. They're, they're far behind peers across the country. They're behind uh, Duke in the region. 
even the best performing utilities in Florida uh, are, are still um, far behind. So you've got Tampa Electric there at, at less than half of, of the average for major utilities. Not shown here, um, but uh, JEA and OUC in Jacksonville and Orlando um, are at a similar level, uh, 0.4 and, and 0.35 respectively. Um, while uh, Duke Energy is, is significantly below and the state's largest utility, which is the recently merged Florida Power and Light and Gulf Power um, under the ownership of, of Nextera, they serve electric power for half, over half of all customers in Florida. And their performance is far, far lower. In fact, because of the size of those utilities and because of uh, uh, the, the uh, poor performance that they have on energy efficiency, they're actually large enough to have shifted the entire regional average down by about 20%. So again, a lot of opportunity here, um, but uh, some real historic challenges. So the opportunity comes in with changes that are now underway to Florida's energy efficiency rules. So it has been um, almost three decades. Um, oh, actually we've got a couple more things here um, where you can see, con continue on to the next. Um, you can see uh, a breakdown that has Jacksonville um, and uh, Orlando on there. You can see the comparison all the way down. Um, I, I would draw attention to one more detail um, which has to do with energy efficiency programs for low income customers. So customers who may be struggling already to pay their energy bill and still afford basic household necessities uh, like food, medicine, rent, all of those things um, would benefit greatly from having lower energy bills that can come through energy efficiency programs for low income customers. So this is another area where there is significant difference between utilities. And I would just kind of draw the, the strong contrast where uh, Florida Power and Light over the last five years um, compared to Duke and Tampa Electric, where Duke was 20 times more efficiency savings for low-income customers and Tampa Electric was delivering 50 times more efficiency savings. We do see over the coming five years uh, ahead of us plans to, um, to increase that for all um, utilities, uh, including Florida Power and Light, um, but there's clearly a real need for this. Um, and there's some real differences. So uh, as I was saying, there are changes now um, being contemplated to the energy efficiency rules that have been in place uh, unchanged for nearly three decades. Um, this is extremely important because Florida's low performance on energy efficiency can be directly tied to outdated practices in these policies. So uh, it's a very good step in the right direction. Um, and, and it reminds me in some regards of how Florida, you know, the Sunshine State was recently criticized for not being uh, a leader on solar energy. And yet there has been a significant change um, in recent time with investment in and, and expansion of solar in Florida. So energy efficiency is still in the, uh, the, the kind of very low performance, but these rule changes have the potential uh, to bring Florida forward in, in a significant way. Um, at heart, the issues that need to be addressed in those energy efficiency rules relate to outdated economic screening practices. Basically, the most affordable, the most impactful energy efficiency measures are being eliminated before they're even considered for setting energy efficiency goals and for utility efficiency program investments. The practices are, uh, that are in place in Florida are in place in no other state in the country. So it is clearly a time for a change. So let's envision what impact such a change could have. And I have here um, a, a projection. If you were to take the um, historically lower levels of energy efficiency in the Southeast and in Florida and bring them up to that 1% level that we discussed earlier, you could see a massive impact. So the carbon reductions in tons would be almost 6 million tons of CO2 reduction for the Southeast. For Florida, that would be approaching 2 million. Um, and uh, the equivalent, if you were to translate that into um, you know, something I think we could maybe more easily relate to would be 
removing uh, gas powered cars um, from the roads um, in Florida alone, there could be the equivalent uh, reduction in carbon emissions um, as 400 cars, uh, 400,000 cars being taken off of the road. Um, one other way for us to, to think about this is the number of houses, um, electricity that could be served through energy saved. Now, I'm, I wanna be clear, I'm not saying this is the number of homes that could have energy efficiency improvements. You could actually reach even many more than this. But the total energy use for over 300,000 homes could be reached in Florida alone if we were to rise up to that 1% level. And I, I wanna put just one more important um, point of reference on this. Uh, it, it goes back to the subject of those who struggle to afford their energy bills and still meet their regular financial uh, household needs. There are more than 5 million customers, approximately 36%, um, served by the largest utilities, those who are governed by the energy efficiency rules that, that I just discussed, um, who meet the federal standard um, for uh, low income and qualifying for bill pay assistance so that they would be able to access um, payments to help them pay their bill, but a much better solution would be for us to be investing instead in energy efficiency that reduces energy waste and reduces energy costs while also reducing carbon emissions. So energy efficiency is a critical tool for us to meet our decarbonization goals. Um, and I think I will close uh, for now with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Forrest. That was really informative and it sounds like we've got a lot of room for improvement on energy efficiency. So now we're gonna turn it over to Brian Jacob, who is our solar program director to hear about uh, solar in the Southeast and solar in Florida. Brian? Thank you, Susan. And thank you, Forrest, for giving me such a good segue. Um, energy efficiency is indeed the best place to start. It kind of reminds me of something that uh, Amory Levins of Rocky Mountain Institute fame used to say about megawatts, the, those, the, the energy that we don't consume. And he would always say that megawatts are more valuable, much more valuable than megawatts. Um, but sooner or later, no matter how much energy efficiency we do and energy conservation we do, we're going to need supply side generation options to complement those demand side efficiency options. Um, and that's where solar comes in. And we certainly have plenty of solar in the Southeast and, and Florida in particular. Uh, as Susan said, I'm Brian Jacob and I lead the solar program for Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. And uh, like the decarbonization report that Maggie mentioned and the energy efficiency report that Forrest mentioned, uh, we also published a, a solar in the Southeast annual report. I'm working on the, the fourth edition right now, hope to get it out uh, in June of this year. But what I've got for you today um, are excerpts from last year's report. And so the one that we published in June of 2020 looked backwards at 2019 and forward to 2023. We always do a, a four year rolling time horizon. Um, but I'll try to weave in some commentary since I'm working on the new report right now to kind of give you a, a preview or hints at what you might expect to see in our next report. Let's start with the Southeast solar capacity forecast. When we looked at the Southeast as a whole last year, we showed that entering 2020, um, there were already more than 10,000 megawatts, 10 gigawatts of solar installed across the, the seven state region that we call the Southeast. Um, that's enough to power about uh, 2 million homes. Or to put it in a different context, the largest coal-fired power plant in the country, the whole United States, is here in my home state of Georgia. It's Plant Shearer, has four units with a total of about three and a half gigawatts. Um, and yes, there's a, a Florida connection to that plant because unit four of Plant Shearer, which is 848 megawatts, is owned by Florida Power and Light and the Jacksonville Electric Authority. Now, granted, those two utilities are in the process of closing that unit, and that should be accomplished by the end of this year. But as we're talking today, um, plant shearer in total, all four units 
three and a half gigawatts of output capacity. So the amount of solar that was already on the ground last year in the Southeast, the 10 gigawatts is more than triple the capacity of that largest um, coal-fired power plant in the United States. Just to kind of put some parameters around that. And whilst, while coal is decreasing, solar is increasing pretty rapidly as this slide shows. Um, in last year's report, we projected that solar capacity in the Southeast would double by 2022. And when we look out to the end point of last year's forecast, 2023, we would be getting 10% of the total generation capacity of all resources in the Southeast would be from solar. So that's a pretty big milestone to look forward to. Now, if we switch to the next slide is the forecast for all each of the Southeastern states broken out. And you can see that Florida has been leading this growth in the Southeast. Uh, wasn't too long ago that Florida overtook Georgia. Um, and we've been watching for when Florida is going to overtake North Carolina. North Carolina until very recently had the second most solar of any state in the country behind California. Uh, and this is the year that we expect Florida to now surpass North Carolina. Just within recent months, Texas has overtaken North Carolina. So Florida's gonna have to wait a little bit longer before they go into that number two slot. But at the, at the kind of growth rate that we're seeing in Florida, it's just a matter of time. Um, and a major driver of that solar growth in Florida last year in particular was the approval of a, a program that Florida Power and Light introduced called Solar Together that is a, a one and a half gigawatts, 1,500 megawatts of new solar in a subscription shared solar model that got approved by the Public Service Commission. That was approved last March, so it was already in last year's report. One thing that was not in last year's report was a comparable program from Duke Energy Florida, uh, 750 megawatts that is a shared solar program, just got approved early this year, early 2021. So it will factor into the report that I'm working on right now. This slide now shows sunrisers. We call, um, well, we, we always identify leaders and laggards in our reports. We call the leaders sun risers, we call the laggards sun blockers. Um, the sun riser designation applies to the seven utilities that exhibit the highest growth in a watts per customer ratio that we use. Um, up until now, we've been talking about total installed capacity in megawatts, each of the previous slides that I showed you. So from now on, I want to talk about this ratio. It, it allows us to fairly and equitably compare the solar penetration of say a small utility with a big utility. And when we would do that, um, three of the top seven last year, the, the highest solar ambition utilities were from Florida. That includes uh, Tampa Electric, which has actually been on our Sunriser list since our very first report. So they've qualified three separate times. Um, it includes Orlando Utilities Commission, which made the list last year for the second time out of our three-year reporting. And we highlighted Gulf Power last year because they hadn't been on the list before. They made their debut as a Sunriser, um, largely because of what, what Forrest mentioned before about um, how Nextera acquired uh, Gulf Power and is in the process of integrating them with Florida Power and Light. The two utilities prepared a combined 10-year site plan last year for the first time, and it increased the solar forecast for Gulf Power. We, it became obvious in looking through that report that Nextera has a, a real intention to shift focus of their solar deployments from the peninsula of Florida, where they'd been focusing the FPL territory, into the panhandle of Florida where they get that kind of late afternoon Western sun, even into a, another time zone, because you've got central time there as opposed to Eastern time. The next slide shows our large utility system ranking. Um, in our reports, we do a, a leaderboard, if you will, that ranks the, the largest utilities of the Southeast 
on the, both the base year, which last year was 2019, and the forecast year 2023. Uh, I've talked a little bit about some of the highlights already from Florida. Tampa, Tampa Electric was our top performing Florida utility last year. Um, and that was um, even before, well, I should say, and, and they already had a plan to build an additional 600 megawatts of solar between then and 2023. So you see them moving up to second place on that leaderboard when you look at the, the right-hand side of this slide there. Um, I've already talked about the Florida Power and Light and Gulf Power Integration, the Solar Together program, almost one and a half gigawatts of new solar that was in the forecast for last year. And I also have mentioned that uh, Duke Energy's program was not approved last year, but uh, I added it to the slide here so that we, you would know that it's going to be integrated into our next report and we start to see them move up kind of on par with what their South Carolina and North Carolina affiliates had been doing. Duke Energy Florida really hadn't been doing as much solar, but they're quickly catching up. They've got a projection that's gonna more than quadruple their uh, solar penetration in this watts per customer ratio. My last slide, um, I, I'm going to use to pivot just a little bit um, because I don't want all of our audience to think, okay, wow, we're doing a lot. Our work here is done. We can relax um, because that's, that's not the message that I want to leave the audience with. There's still a lot more that we have to do. This is a slide that I used last year in the net metering workshop that the Florida Public Service Commission hosted. And the point that I wanted to illustrate was that even with all of this solar growth that we have witnessed and are witnessing in Florida, on a watts per customer ratio, it really only gets the state of Florida up to about the average for the region. Um, if you actually look at the graph there, it's a little bit hard to tell the Florida color, but it corresponds to the geographic map on the, on the top of the slide there too. And it wasn't until last year that Florida got ahead of Mississippi in watts per customer. And even out to 2023, Florida is still going to be trailing Georgia and North Carolina and South Carolina when we look at this watts per customer ratio. Again, a really important normalizing metric for us to be able to compare a state with a large population versus a state with a small population. Um, so I, I really wanted to offer that mainly for our audience members who might see the glass only as half full um, or only partially full. certainly nowhere near overflowing at this point. Um, and if I quickly relate all this back to decarbonization, every kilowatt hour of solar prevents the release of almost a pound of CO2 emissions. So the four gigawatts approximately of solar that we already have installed in Florida are already preventing over 8 billion pounds of CO2 per year, every year, and that's growing. Um, but to put it in context, Florida's emissions from the power sector are about 200 billion pounds per year, about 100 million tons. Um, so solar is already reducing that by a little over 4%. And that, that's good news. Um, and solar is obviously one of the clean energy resources, but only one of them. <laughs> yeah, we've got energy efficiency and we're gonna talk about transportation sector here in just a minute. Um, so it's good news, but we've got a lot more to do if we need to align with what the science says is necessary and completely decarbonize the electricity sector. So I wanna thank the audience for everything you're doing to pursue that objective and rest assured that SACE is gonna be right there along with you. Thanks so much, Brian. I think the growth in solar is uh, really encouraging. And as, as Maggie laid out, we're gonna need every single uh, you know, piece of the puzzle and solar is certainly a big piece. And as Maggie said, uh, the transportation sector overcame the power plant emission sector uh, a few years back. So it's more important than ever. And I'm very excited to introduce uh, my colleague, Stan Cross, the Electrification Transportation Policy Director for the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. Take it away, Stan. 
Thank you, Susan, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I look forward to talking to you about transportation in Florida and the electrification uh, of mobility in the Sunshine State. So one of the things that we do at Southern Alliance for Clean Energy, along with the reports that you've just heard, is we also look at transportation electrification at both the regional and state level. And last October, we published a report on transportation electrification in Florida with our partners, Atlas Public Policy. And a lot of the facts that I'll be talking about over the next few minutes come from that report, which is available online at electrifythesouth.org. So on my first slide, uh, I always start the conversation about transportation electrification by looking at where the money is flowing and where the investment is happening. The, the movement towards electric vehicles is a relatively new industry. And as any new industry, it takes time to ramp up. And what we've been seeing in the past few years is that ramping really starting to accelerate. Uh, it is a global market. It's part of the global economy. And so what happens in Europe and China and India has bearing on what's happening in the US and what's happening in Florida. And what we've been seeing over the last year in particular are a lot of announcements from auto manufacturers, including GM and Volvo and Subaru and Toyota and BMW, all committing uh, to ceasing production of internal combustion engines with GM and Volvo leading the charge by doing so by 2035. We also see automakers like Volkswagen uh, ceasing to do any R&D with internal combustion engines, focusing all of that development on electrification. And you see this shift happening with the automakers in part because there's a lot of policy pressure. You have countries in Europe and China and India, as well as the states of California and New York who have all committed to banning internal combustion engines, the cars and trucks we drive today, by 2035. And so that is causing market momentum and it's also giving the automakers the confidence that they can make this shift and make it profitable. What we also see happening is, is the investment is being made to support that transition. And that investment, just like the market is global, and the US is doing a pretty good job right now of, of getting a lot of that investment brought here to our country, especially to the Southeast where about 25% of that investment is being made today to support jobs here in the region. In Florida, there's not, uh, there's not currently EV manufacturing happening, but there's a lot of supply chain companies and a lot of technology innovation that's happening in Florida to support the electrification. And so more of that investment dollars coming to the US means more of that investment dollars coming to, to Florida. So in the next slide, we'll look at EV sales. And there's a lot going on on this slide. So let me just zero in on a couple of things. The first thing I wanna draw your attention to are the blue bars. The blue bars are Tesla's. And you can see very clearly that Tesla is dominating this market. Uh, and that, that position that Tesla has, along with the investment and the policies that are being passed, is really encouraging the auto industry to step up their game uh, because they see Tesla pulling far ahead and want to make sure that they can keep up for this transition. The other thing I want to draw your attention to is the very last bar on the bar graph that reflects the fourth quarter of 2020. And I want to note that coming out of a year where we've all been uh, suffering from the consequences of the pandemic, we see electric vehicles tying for the second greatest quarter of sales they've had so far. And what this is demonstrating is that coming out of the pandemic, electric vehicles are proving to be more resilient as a technology than cars themselves. Uh, the, the hit to the EV market was much less than it was to autos in general, and the recovery for EVs has been much quicker. And we expect that growth to continue to be ramping up uh, in, in the years to come. So one of the things that we do in our reports is we track a variety of indicators. And for transportation, you know, we're tracking sales, EV charging deployment, utility investment, and government funding, among other things. What I want to draw your attention to is that in Florida, currently, looking at just gross EV sales, 
Florida ranks number two in the country, right? So Florida is kicking gas. But just like Brian mentioned with solar, when you look at it on a per capita basis, how many EVs uh, you know, per thousand people, Florida drops to 18th in the nation, right? So Florida's pulling ahead in gross sales, but has a lot of room to grow when it comes to per capita adoption. You see a similar scenario in EV charging deployment where the state's again, second in the nation with the number of chargers that have been deployed. But when you look at that on a per capita basis, in this case, we look at it per thousand people, Florida's 30th in the nation, right? So that, that, that shows you that, you know, when you're thinking about how do we ramp up this market, there's this direct correlation between EV ownership and EV charging deployment. Consumers need to feel confident that the EV chargers are in place to support their mobility needs. And, uh, and when those chargers are installed and in place, it provides that confidence in consumers to purchase. So being 30th in the nation for EV charging deployment leaves, leaves really a lot of room to grow, as does current utility investment in government funding, uh, which represents about 1% of uh, utility investment in government funding to date in the country. So there's, again, a lot of room to grow. You're starting to see utilities lean in. Uh, to the space and looking to, to invest. Uh, and the government is doing the same through the Volkswagen settlement funds, but there's a lot of room to move here. And when you look nationwide, the states that have more significant utility investment and more significant government funding, uh, as well as supportive electric vehicle policies is where you see EV adoption really strong. So EVs as, as both Maggie and, and Brian were mentioning, you know, have this direct correlation to electricity consumption. And one of the coolest things about electric vehicles, besides the fact that they're high performance cars that are quiet and awesome to drive with cutting edge technology, is that they are consuming electricity instead of gasoline. And so when you're consuming electricity instead of gasoline, uh, you have a much more efficient system. And because of that efficiency, right, EVs already plugging into the day's utility mix that, that we've heard about already in this presentation is like driving a car that gets 87 miles per gallon from a carbon perspective. So even in today's utility mix, driving an EV is a significant climate solution for Florida. And the beautiful thing is as Brian was saying, every day the grid gets cleaner. Well, if you own an EV, every day your EV gets cleaner. So you're just gonna be offsetting more and more carbon emissions the longer you drive. In addition to those carbon emissions, there's also the benefit of not having any tailpipe emissions. I think we've all become acutely aware of the connection between public health and air pollution during this pandemic. And eliminating those tailpipes from cars and especially from trucks and buses significantly improves public health and improves public health for communities that are often overburdened most by that pollution, uh, our, our low to moderate income communities, our black and brown communities, that, and, our, and some of our rural communities that are located on those transportation corridors where that pollution is most densely concentrated. And then thirdly, when you drive an EV, it costs a lot less. Driving an EV can save a consumer between six and $10,000 over the life of that vehicle. That's significant. And so enabling folks to drive EVs doesn't only, only address climate and public health, but it saves people money. And so coupling that with the energy efficiency that Forrest was talking about, you can start to see this, this, real, this sort of future where we're using less and what, what we're using is electrified by more and more renewable energy. And if we take all of that and put it in the car, then all of a sudden we're getting, we're sort of maximizing the climate benefit of our investments in both cleaning the grid and cleaning transportation. So I'll leave you with that. And on that note, thank you very much for your time and for listening. I'll turn it back over to Susan. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, those were uh, four presentations chock full of information. So we only have about 10 minutes before we need to wrap up. So we're going to, I'm going to kind of go back through one more time and uh, starting uh, with Maggie, 
uh, really, and if you have a comment, Maggie, on sort of what you heard our colleagues say, but what I wanna hear most is when you talk about decarbonization and how we're gonna get there, can you talk about the need for policy, sort of the what and the why of needing policy to get where we need to go? Thanks, Susan, and, and a great question. And this is, um, you know, really what we, are, uh, are talking about and, and thinking about, especially in this moment. Um, and, and one thing that we are seeing is, you know, along with all of the really promising, um, uh, you know, market drivers, uh, such as, you know, Stan mentioned saving money, driving an electric car. I mean, we've seen the, the cost of solar um, come down. We've seen, uh, you know, um, efficiency standards, you know, really drive um, the, uh, the, the, the um, appliances that we're buying to be more efficient. Um, but, you know, all of those things are pushing us in the right direction. Uh, but the question is, is it going to get us there, you know, where we need to go? Um, and from what we're seeing, we really do need some sort of, you know, push towards a, a larger goal. Um, you know, we need to decarbonize the grid by 2030. We need to electrify transportation by uh, 2050. I mean, there there are these are you know placeholder goals, but we need to have something larger that's going to push us there because you know the market's really not doing it all by itself. Um, it needs to be you know a combination of this kind of push and pull, carrots and sticks, um, and and everybody getting involved. Um, you know, policy and um, policymakers um, and and all of you guys. So um, it's it's an important reason why we do uh, the work that we do. Yeah, I think it's so important, as you said it's up front. If you you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So it's super important. So Forrest, I want to go back to you for uh, just a minute. Um, you mentioned there is a rulemaking at the Florida Public Service Commission. Um, I know that our Florida Utilities out of fifty-two, or Tampa Electric is forty-six. Duke Energy is 48 and Florida Power and Light is 51 out of 52 in terms of energy efficiency. So what could be the impact of the rulemaking um, looking at if, if they're doing the right thing of those antiquated cost benefit tests? Well, that is a great question. And I think you put it in just the right frame. Are we talking about a glass half, glass half empty, glass half full? Um, certainly we have a lot of improvement to make in Florida, but the upside of that is that means there is a tremendous amount of energy savings potential that we can still capture. So indeed, changing the rules is how Florida will step into a higher performance um, category. And it's going to come directly from adopting modern industry standard practices. As I noted earlier, Florida is the only state to use the outdated practices um, that they do with cost effectiveness screening, that can be changed. And that would be a simple and large step forward for Florida. The upside of that would be that we should reasonably expect to see energy efficiency performance for Florida's utilities move up at least towards the average for the country. And, and I think it goes, you know, without saying it's sort of an obvious point, that the average is not ultimately the target that we're aiming for. You know, by definition, there's as much utility savings above the average as there is below that, that level. Um, but for Florida, for where we are right now, just embracing modern standard industry practices is going to make a big difference. This rulemaking is underway right now. There has been one public workshop related to it. Um, the, the commissioners uh, who are ultimately making this decision um, need to hear from the public. They need to hear from citizens. They need to hear from our local governments that have been um, showing more leadership on clean energy than uh, sometimes the state has. Uh, and ultimately we can look forward to energy savings with lower bills and reduced energy waste when we move forward with energy efficiency. So uh, again, there's uh, a lot of opportunity for us to go up from where we are right now. Thanks, Forrest. And clearly, uh, the most vulnerable and the people who, who need the help the most are most impacted when you don't have utility scale programs. So for those who are listening who would like to take a quick, easy action, there is a website set up, energysmartfl.com, energysmart.com. 
fl.com and that'll help you uh, weigh in and send a letter to the Public Service Commission uh, with, with relative ease. It'll just take a minute or two. So um, thank you for that. Uh, Brian, so we're gonna flip right back to solar because I would like to hear you talk about two things, which is how do we accelerate the transition to solar in Florida? And then can you sort of speak to utility scale versus rooftop solar, Brian? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the most important thing we can do to uh, accelerate the transition to solar is is to vote. Um, uh, Maggie kind of mentioned it already as well about us needing a, a carrot and sticks approach. Um, so I would say people should vote for clean energy candidates. Um, and since this is not an election year, I'd kind of take it a step further and say talk to the people who have already been elected into those positions. There are the, the Florida legislature is dealing with a number of clean energy bills right now. Um, things that deal with solar on schools, um, bills that would allow the, the solar farms in Florida to be double the size that they are now. Um, and, and then there's a couple clean energy standards too. Both the House and the Senate have a clean energy standard um, bill. So I would say talk to your um, representatives and, and state senators. I would say talk to people in DC as well, because the um, the Clean Futures Act is in play at the federal level. And uh, we, need, we need all levels of uh, persuasion to get us onto the pace of change that's necessary uh, to, to thwart the, the worst of the cl climate crisis. Um, let's see, your second question was about the scale, utility scale versus rooftop. That's right. Um, yeah, so at SACE, we often say that uh, we, we support solar across all different market segments. So we want to see the utility scale segment succeeding, the you know, commercial and industrial scale, the uh, community and shared solar subscription models like I talked about, as well as the customer-owned rooftop solar. Um, not any one to the exclusion of the others, and so, so we've supported the utilities on some of these major utility scale projects. Um, we, we helped kind of negotiate behind the scenes to get some of the, some improvements in those programs. Um, but we also called out the solar cavalry as I called them last year during that net metering workshop and getting letters into the public service commission to try to defend one-to-one -one retail net metering that, that Florida has now arguing that, um, you know, the, the penetration had not reached a level yet that warranted doing anything different. It was working, don't mess with it. Um, they're both very important, utility scale and residential rooftop. That's right, we wanna make sure that Florida families and, and businesses, small businesses, get the same benefit and opportunity um, that the utilities get and, and larger customers. So it's really important that we have uh, both. So thank you for that. So Stan, on kind of a similar vein, you know, how does Florida become more of a leader in the Southeast uh, you know, region? And, and what is the role that government plays in that as well? I think Florida is poised uh, to, to continue to build on, on its leadership position. Right now, the Florida Department of Energy and the Florida Department of Transportation, the Energy Office, Florida Department of Transportation and the Public Service Commission are all working on the Florida EV Master Plan, which the legislature uh, required them all to do. And that process is gonna be completed in the next few months. Many stakeholders have been involved and there's a really robust and strong plan being developed that at this point, um, Florida Department of Transportation is leading getting over the finish line. Um, so I think getting that plan in place and as part of that plan, setting an aggressive goal for adoption, both for consumers and for fleets in Florida, will be really important to signal to the market that Florida is truly pursuing electrification of transportation and, and, and with that signaling, you know, bring in that, that increased investment to support EV charging deployment and also the availability of electric vehicles for consumers to purchase. When it comes to the role of state government, as with any disruptive nascent industry, uh, support is always needed. Government supported us transitioning from landlines to cellular phones. It's supporting broadband access across the state and the country. 
And this transition to electric vehicles requires support as well. Um, it's disrupting a, the status quo of the last 100 years. And it's doing so because driving electric is a better solution for a mobility, whether it's freight and delivery trucks, school and transit buses, or the car that's parked in your garage, electrifying that transportation is gonna save consumers money, save taxpayers money, improve public health, and address the leading sector of climate emissions in our country right now. So there's a lot of benefits that come from that. So government support, uh, you know, it enables everyone to access all of those benefits as well as getting the technology rolling. That's great. Yeah, it, a lot of people don't realize that taking an internal combustion engine off the road is one of the fastest ways or maybe the fastest way uh, to address climate change. And um, the issue of global climate change is really an interesting one because it's one where the individual person can take an action like making your own home more efficient or getting an electric vehicle. Um, but it's also a global problem and requires policy at the local, at the state and the federal level. So uh, we all have our work cut out for us because it is an epic problem. And I hope that everybody who's listening today, I want to thank again the Volo Foundation for organizing Florida Climate Week. And please visit us at cleanenergy.org. As you heard today, we're going to have updated versions of the reports that you heard about coming along soon. So with your morning coffee or tea, please check cleanenergy.org and look for those new reports as they come out. And I am so proud to be here uh, with my amazing colleagues. So thank you for taking time uh, to be part of this. And uh, we wish everyone a wonderful Florida Climate Week. And we need to all come together and work even harder and rededicate our Ourselves, uh, to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and to protect Florida into the future. So with that, I thank you.